Our first reading today is from Genesis chapter 45. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Our psalm that we read responsively is from Psalm 37. Do not... Be provoked by evildoers. Do not be jealous of those who do wrong. Soon wither like the grass, and like the grass fade away. Put your trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and find safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, who shall give your heart's desire. Commit your way to the Lord. Put your trust in the Lord and see what God will do. The Lord will make your vindication as clear as the light and the justice of your case like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently. Do not be provoked by the one who prospers, the one who succeeds in evil schemes. Refrain from anger. Leave rage alone. Do not be provoked. It leads only to evil. For evil do doers shall be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord shall possess the land. In a little while the wicked shall be no more. Even if you search out their place, they will not be there. But the lowly shall possess the land. They will delight in abundance of peace. But the deliverance of the righteous comes from you, O Lord. You are their stronghold in time of trouble. You, O Lord, will help them and rescue them. You will rescue them from the wicked and deliver them because in you they seek refuge. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a physical body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual That is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. 
As was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I invite you all to stand as you're able for our gospel. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, But I say to you that listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Dear friends, grace and peace to all of you from God who transforms what perishes into imperishable and what is mortal into immortal. Amen. The readings today from Genesis and Corinthians and the Gospel of Luke don't seem to have too much in common. All are somewhat familiar and they're beloved for many reasons, but they have to do with very separate events. We heard the climax of the stories from Joseph's uh, cycle of stories and his family in the last chapters of the book of Genesis. We read together the climax of Paul's letter to the believers in the city of Corinth a climax that asserts the reality of bodily resurrection for the church, for Christ and for all who believe. And finally, we heard more from Christ's Sermon on the Plain, a bit of which we heard last week. This reading continues that. And Christ urges believers to offer unbelievable grace to even those who we think of as enemies. The kind of radical grace that Jesus uses to describe the love of God to all who hear. The passages don't seem to have a lot in common, rich as they are. They don't seem to be that related, but there is a way for us to hear these stories 
and to find a common thread weaving through them all. We can read these passages and hear them this morning and find comfort and encouragement in how they go together. We can see in these stories how God works in the lives of the ordinary to, ex to achieve extraordinary lives. We see how God, how God works in the lives of the ordinary to achieve extraordinary lives. These stories all point out how the Lord achieves a transformation in the lives of his chosen, in the lives of those who are filled with the Holy Spirit. These stories all show us how God's power transforms, changes, alters, and improves the lives of all who believe including each one of us. Transformation flows beneath the narrative of each of these passages of Scripture. And in this season of Epiphany, these readings reveal something about how the Lord works and what the Lord is capable of. They reveal what the Lord can do for you. I think these stories are every bit as miraculous as the best-known miracles that we read of Jesus. They're every bit as miraculous as walking on water. They're every bit as miraculous as healing the deaf and the blind or turning water into wine. They are just as miraculous, but they take a little longer. They take longer. Transformations can be instant water to wine, like the best-known miracles. But transformations can also happen over time. They can happen in the fullness of time. That's how scripture describes them. In the fullness of time, God's transformations take place. In the Genesis story of Joseph, we see his character transformed. When we met Joseph, Chapters earlier, he was the young and the most favored son of Jacob. Because he was the apple of dad's eye, his brothers were jealous. Jealous and even enraged. So enraged were his brothers that they sold Joseph to a group of roving slave traders who took him to Egypt. The child that we might think of as a spoiled brat, that's maybe stretching, perhaps, but not stretching by much. That child is, by the time that we encounter him in today's reading, no longer a slave. He became the Pharaoh's second in command, a trusted advisor and a powerful man in the leadership of a nation. At a very vital time, for a long famine was taking place. Joseph's counsel to Pharaoh meant that food was stored and plans were made to set aside enough to last through the famine so that the people could live. Joseph was transformed from spoiled brat to generous and life-giving son, even to his brothers. Who betrayed him. When his brothers finally met him again, and we meet one of their encounters in our reading today, they feared the truth coming out of Jacob, uh, out of coming out of Joseph, and they feared the consequence of their evil. They feared their father knowing the truth. Joseph, though, was transformed, and he explained all that had happened in theological terms. God, he said, arranged it all. Even their evil was arranged by God to save many, many lives. Even their own lives. That took many years, of course. But through Joseph's transformation, God preserved a remnant, kept alive a people, saved many, many survivors from the famine. God did this 
Joseph said. God did this. A God who transforms even evil intentions into a saving act. Evil intentions transformed into a saving act. That's what happened in Christ's resurrection. Paul says that in his reading. Christ's death was an act of evil intention, and by raising Christ from the dead, God transformed an act of evil into a saving act. The people of the church in Corinth had a lot of questions. And part of those questions about how this would work for them, how this transformation worked for them and their loved ones who died. They wondered, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body are the dead raised? So Paul described a transformation to them. In a short answer, he described a transformation. A transformation from perishable to imperishable, from dishonored to glory, from weak to being raised in power, and from the physical to being raised spiritual. That is a transformation. Paul goes on to say it's, it's like the way that a seed is planted, and the seed dies and yet is transformed into a leafy grain. What dies in the ground rises to new life. What dies a bare seed is raised, nay, transformed into a body, a living body. What is flesh and blood, Paul says, cannot inherit the kingdom without that transformation, which only God can grant. And God grants that to flesh and blood. God does this for all who believe, because God did this through Jesus. Through Jesus, the perishable is transformed and raised imperishable. Through Jesus, the physical is transformed and raised spiritual. In the gospel, Jesus teaches the crowds about God's grace, God's mercy. Jesus said, God is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Be merciful, he said, just as your father is merciful. But we can't. We can't. Love my enemies. Bless those who curse me. Give everything. Expect nothing in return. Forgive everything. We can't. Not without a transformation. The kind of radical love and radical grace that Jesus describes is not easy. It's difficult. And without help, it is too much for us. Love your enemies. But Jesus described a radical grace from the Lord, radical grace that can be miraculous. Jesus described the kind of grace that transforms, the kind of love and mercy that changes, changes people, changes hearts, changes us. Jesus described just what God wants to do, transform us by God's grace to be God's gracious people. That, in my mind, would be a miracle. <laughs> but it takes time. It can even take a lifetime. But just consider a world, a kingdom, if you will, that is like that. Instead of Europe being on the brink of war, imagine, consider a kingdom like Jesus describes. Instead of injustice for people of color, imagine a world, a kingdom, 
like Jesus describes. And instead of partisan fighting among Americans, imagine the kind of kingdom that Jesus proclaims. And then, dear friends, seek God and hear Jesus and pray. Pray for the Holy Spirit to fill you, and to fill those around you, and then look for a transformation. But look in your own heart first. Beginning in your own heart, in your own faith. A faith in a God who is gracious and generous and life-giving, a faith that is indeed miraculous, that in my mind would be a miracle. But it does take time, and it can even take a lifetime.